Right, welcome back everyone. Uh, it says here, quiet in the hall, but you did that for yourselves, so um, I don't have to worry about that. Um, so, uh, welcome back from lunch. Thank you for being so prompt. Um, can I mention on your tables, um, there are uh, uh, some leaflets from another set of sponsors. So, Ringgold, who are, sorry other sponsors, but they're our favorite sponsor because they were our first sponsor. Um, and they signed their sponsorship contract immediately when asked. It was basically scribbled on the back of my business card, so bless them for that. Um, but also Redlink are a, a very welcome sponsor of the conference and you'll find some information about them on the tables as well. So thank you for that. Um, so, uh, right, I'm just looking at anything else I need to do. No, I don't have any other tasks other than to uh, welcome you to this panel. I can tell you this is a very unusual panel. Um, Mostly panels, in my experience, uh, the panelists sort of just turn up and say to the chair, yeah, what was this panel about again? I happen to know this group of people have prepared furiously over the last two months uh, to give you the most fabulous panel you could possibly imagine. So I don't want to raise your expectation too high, but I think it's entirely justified. But I think, it's, I think you're going to find it's been entirely justified. So I'm just going to hand over to John and let the panel do their thing. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our session. Which is on artificial intelligence in the knowledge chain. Um, today on the panel, we have um, a very esteemed, a very esteemed panel. I'm really sorry I haven't got anything on the screen here. No. A very esteemed panel. We have Phil Jones who is an experienced executive director and technology and product specialist. Phil lives in Edinburgh in a muse house within a conservation area. After moving in, he converted the summer house to an office. The project took a lot longer than expected because upon commencing the project, he discovered the floor was rotten and the roof needed replacing. And finally, the walls could do with a rebuild. It's still the same building though, because he'd need planning permission to tear it down and start again. <laughs> It's known as Theseus's Shed. Daniel Ebnitzer is CEO at Carga. Earlier in his career, Daniel sold steel sheets and aluminium tubes when he built the e-business joint venture metal for You for a bunch of Swiss distributors. Jennifer Shivas is Head of Strategy and Industry Engagement at 67 Bricks. Jennifer is a big snooker fan and loves Alan Angles McManus. And Isabel Thompson is Senior Strategy Analyst at Holtzbrink. Isabel has recently taken up improv, so now spends her Wednesday evenings pretending to be everything from a one-eyed dog to an astronaut. I'm John White. I'm VP of Sales and Marketing at Page Magic. Um, I have big difficulties buying clothes and shoes that fit. I've recently started training for a cross-channel swim, as I figured it would be the quickest and easiest way to get to European me meetings very soon. So let's look at some um, current trends in other industries in terms of AI. In media, automating formulaic business and sports reporting and uh, using machine learning to sift through social media to verify potential news leads is used widely now. In advertising, exploring a variety of ways to tailor messaging based on reader user behavior is, is on the up. In entertainment, recommending other films, TV, music based on past use, it's all run by artificial intelligence. And in medical, analysing complex healthcare data to help doctors better diagnose and plan for a patient's future's need is being used widely. It was Arthur C. Clarke who said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, we are going to talk more about the technology side today, and we hope by the end of this, um, you'll see that it isn't magic. It's just the inevitable advancement of technology. Our format today is going to be four short presentations and a panel discussion with Q&A. Now, you can join the Q&A online. There's a website there. If you get your phones out, uh, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And if you then enter that code, at the given time, we've got um, five slides where there's going to be a poll. 
and then we have a slide where they're going to be open questions at the end and you can actually add to those and um, we'll tell you about it um, um, when we get there. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to Phil Jones who's going to talk to you more about his expertise. Yes, I'm going to do the poll first. All right, so... There we go. The code is 86, 27, 91. We're just a little technical hiccup here. With the monitors have all gone off. This is why everyone's going to be like doing this backwards and forwards all session, because we can't see what we're looking at. But I think we should just... Yeah, artificial intelligence, indeed. All right, so is everybody ready now for, the, uh, for, our, uh, for our little kind of... Not pop quiz, but kind of pop poll, if you like. Um, so, this, this, um, this poll, we have to give credit to Isabel for finding this. It comes from a, a website that uh, PwC have put up, and it's basically gauging whether we are going to be optimists, excuse me, optimists or pessimists about the future of artificial intelligence. So, we're, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. You're going to answer those questions using the menti.com website that you've all got open on your phones and laptops right now. And then we're going to compare it to the opinions of CEOs from different countries. So it's going to be interesting. We're going to see where we sit. So the first question, do you agree with this statement? AI will become as smart as humans. So press the button and then press submit. You might have to scroll down to see the submit on some mobile phones. Oh, we see we've got some variation here. It's not exactly a normal distribution. It's not Gaussian. Disagree is in the lead. If you're a strong agree, now's the time to vote. All right, when we hit about... Okay, it seems to have stopped around there. So we've got disagree. Oh, no. I think we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna call time on this one. Um, if you didn't get a chance to vote, make sure you're quicker next time. Um, it looks like disagree is the answer to the first question. So the next one, AI will have a larger impact on the world than the internet revolution. Oh, strongly, dis strongly agree. That's very good. Oh, we're, we're split between agree and disagree. It's a tight race. I'm going to have to, oh, I was going to call it, but I don't know, it's neck and neck. I th yeah, I think we're going to have to, because we're so split, I think we're going to have to go for don't know. I think we're going to have to go for don't know. I think that's the safest, because the room does not know, right? Okay, here's the, here's the next one. AI is good for society. Well, this is interesting. This is a more a normal distribution. Oh, no, it's skewed now. It was a normal distribution a second ago, and now it's gone skewed. Excellent. It looks like agree is the, is the winner here. All right. Okay, so is this the last question? It might be. AI will eliminate human bias, such as gender bias. Oh, surge there for strong, early surge for strongly disagree. For some reason, it's not showing on the big screen. There we go. I have to do two at once now. There we go. Well, we're neck and neck between disagree and strongly disagree. I think strong disagree is coming out top. So definitely we don't agree that it's going to eliminate gender bias, do we? So we're going to go disagree. And will a, will, beg your pardon, AI will displace more jobs than it creates in the long run. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? Oh, uh, yeah, we agree he's doing pretty well. We're all quite optimistic about job displacement. <laughs> all right, so we think, we honestly think the machines, the computers are coming for our jobs, it looks like. So we agree that AI will displace more jobs than it creates in the long run. Or is that tight enough to say don't know? What do you think? I think we're going with agree. We're going to go with agree. All right. And so, yeah, now we get the results. 
I think we've got to do sophisticated kind of mobile phone two device thing. All right, so here's, the, so here's how you compare. Here's how the room compares. So we get a score of, of zero, a weighted score of zero, which makes us slightly less than the least optimistic CEOs, right? Or is that, no, Russia is at plus two. So we are more optimistic than Russian CEOs, but much, much less optimistic than Chinese ones. The Chinese CEOs are at 31. Um, the UK is at about four. Uh, Western Europe is at seven, we're at zero, so we're massive pessimists compared to everyone else. Yeah, we're quite pessimistic. We're quite down on the whole <laughs> computers and AI revolution. Right. Okay, so, so we're going we're gonna to bear that in mind. We're going to see how our opinions change um, throughout the session. So, so bear in mind whether you become more optimistic or pessimistic. I think the panel generally wants you to tend towards more optimistic, so we'll see how much of a good mm -hmm. job we do of selling the whole idea of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So, now on to my opening remarks. So, when we first started talking about this panel, uh, we, we kind of divided things up into areas that we were all going to talk about. And I volunteered to be kind of the futurist amongst the group and talk about the trends and where machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to head. One of the first things I read was a, was a report from the consultancy PwC. And I'm going to quote the very first paragraph of that report to you now. Here's some actionable advice on artificial intelligence that you can use today. So hang on, here it comes. If someone tells you they know exactly what AI will look like and do in 10 years, smile politely, then change the subject or walk away. So I thought that's not terribly helpful, is it? But thinking a bit deeper about that statement, it's not possible for us to tell you exactly what machine learning and AI are going to be doing in the future. But what we can do is extrapolate from the trends that we're seeing today and get a sense of what sort of skills we're going to require as an industry and what sort of things we're going to look towards doing in the future in order to, if you like, future-proof ourselves and remain competitive and relevant as an entire scholarly communications sector, if you like. So let's look at what we're doing already. Uh, my previous employer, Digital Science, um, does a lot of um, work in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And if you look on the website, you'll see some resources around research reports which are using particularly natural language processing techniques. One of the projects that I was involved with in that is a really good example, I think, of some of the early benefits of machine learning. What we did was we took a large corpus of literature and we used a text mining technique to identify the topics and ideas that were being talked about. To my mind, what was interesting about this is it's what, in a sense, comes after taxonomies and ontologies. It's instead of a group of experts getting in the room and deciding what the taxonomy of a particular discipline looks like and then fitting all of your research articles into whichever bucket you think is most relevant, instead, you ask the content itself to tell you what the ideas are being talked about, what ideas are being talked about. And after that, you can look at where ideas are converging, where they're di diverging, where meanings of words are shifting, perhaps. And you can get a sense of the direction in terms of topics and ideas that the literature and the discipline is taking. The advantage of doing this, to me, or one very strong advantage of doing this, is that you can get a sense of what's happening before the discipline and the academy itself has codified those disciplines and realized that those changes are happening. So it gives you an advanced view, if you like, of where the ideas and the thoughts are flowing. And that's just one particular example of what will be fairly rudimentary techniques compared to what we're doing in five or 10 years' time. So looking to the future, people are moving beyond things like just looking at topics and they're looking at things like assertion mapping where people are looking at the actual words themselves and understanding what the meanings of those sentences are and then analyzing how those meanings relate to one another in the different pieces of content. That allows you then to find connections between ideas. Now this reminds me of when I was a real academic back at, uh, back at Harvard, I had a supervisor who told me a story about a particular protein. And this particular protein, which was encoded by a particular gene, 
there were two research disciplines, if you like, that identified this particular protein as, as interesting. One of these was Alzheimer's disease, the other one was in gut microbiome. And for many years, the two research disciplines, not just two researchers, not just two labs, but two disciplines, pursued the same particular protein and didn't realize they were looking at the same one. It wasn't until somebody moved from discipline to discipline that they realized there was so much in common that it was probably going to be the same thing that they were looking at. And this tells me, what I take from this, is that there's an awful lot of latent information within the literature that people just don't have the time to discover because there's just so much content. And that is how informatics and artificial intelligence and text mining and machine learning is going to be really driving forward um, those kinds of discoveries in the future. Uh, or at least that's one way that it'll happen. So I'm running low on time probably for my, for my opening statement, um, but some of the other stuff that I think we'll probably talk about during the panel that I'd like to, like to touch on is, is job displacement. Um, I think that um, in the same way that uh, manufacturing jobs were often recognized in the 20th century, um, we're going to see more and more stuff in the service industry and in the knowledge economy being automated uh, by computers and machine learning in the 21st century. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have less people employed altogether, because if you think about the history of technology, we've been through technolo technological revolution again and again and again, and we're still managing to employ more people now than we ever have before. So there is a tendency for technology to create value and to create jobs. In particular, I think when it comes to these sorts of technologies, the jobs that will be growing are not just the technical developer jobs, if you like, of the people who write the technology, but we're going to need more and more people who are able to understand the technology enough to be able to apply it. People who can operate the machinery, if you like. So the machinery replaces people, but you need new people to operate that machinery. And I think that's, that's a need that we haven't fully identified, I think, as a society, never mind an industry, and I think we'll get a better handle on that in the coming year. So with that, I best hand off to Daniel, who's going to, who's going to continue our narrative for us. Thank you. So who knows what kind of bird this is? It's a, a quetzal from Latin America. In the mythology of the ancient Aztecs and Mayas, the quetzal was the bringer of wisdom to mankind. These days, the quetzal seems to be going through a rough patch, facing new competition. Uh, shiny PowerPoint presentations try and make us believe that is now, it is now indeed artificial intelligence that will be superior not only to birds but also to mankind as a bringer of wisdom. The Quetzal is also the mascot of a company called Quirtle and I should probably disclose here that Cargo acquired a substantial stake in Quirtle at the beginning of this year. Uh, what I will deliver now is certainly no sales pitch, but very brief thoughts on artificial intelligence in our industry, the window of opportunity for tech investments for small publishers like Carger is one, and how to separate the wheat from the chaff in AI solutions. Under its newly developed strategy, Cargo intends to remain strong in its core territory of scholarly publishing in the health sciences, keeping its focus on knowledge that matters and being consistently open for open. The second territory to your far right consists of the portion of the knowledge cycle traditional publishers were not present in, where research actually take place, takes place long before an original article is ready for publication. This is mainly the territory of open research tools and services where user experiences make the difference. Finally, Cargo wants to do more for doctors and patients 
as the smaller second cycle on the left indicates. And now it's amazing how artificial intelligence or machine learning or other variants of artificial intelligence have already penetrated all of these territories as shown by the use cases that you see outside along the two cycles. This said, it is crucial for Kagor or for what it's worth for any of you here present to become AI savvy through staff empowerment, partnerships with service providers and in the corporate space acquisitions. The window of opportunity for acquisitions in the emerging technology space is limited for a company like Cargor. Roughly spoken, we have an order of magnitude less revenue than Elsevier makes profit. So we just can't afford companies where the valuation is for the major part based on hype rather than realistic business plans. We have experienced that the domain of AI is especially prone to this. On the other end of the spectrum, there's the need for trial and error. But what if you have invested into three companies doing more or less the same thing? Whom of them will you make part of your own workflows and products? This leaves us with a kind of a sweet spot in the middle where companies have a viable product, first pilot projects or customers, and now need a partner to enter a phase of sustainable growth together. Also at Cargor, strategic fit is absolutely paramount. I don't think we would have invested in this company, Quirtle, if they weren't focused on the health sciences much as Cargor itself. Now back to Quirtle. This slide is about Quirtle's bio AI system. It shows how AI can develop its full potential in the field of information discovery. As you can see, AI components based on neural networks and other AI approaches are present everywhere. It's the pink boxes on this slide. They're present everywhere, be it during the ingestion of content, understanding the content, be it in query processing, understanding what the user is looking for, this goes forgotten in many systems, by the way, and also in what happens with the result after the first search. I'd also like to point out specifically that the AI compatible ontology mentioned at the bottom is not exclusively machine generated, but constantly optimized by hand by specialists in the biomedical field. We believe this makes a huge difference for the user. So now I'm going to leave you here with a slightly different picture of the Quetzal and look forward to the discussion with the panel and you all. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can we say, yeah. Um, so my name is Jennifer Shivas and I'm Head of Strategy and Industry Engagement at a company called 67 Bricks. Um, very briefly, 67 Bricks are a software development consultancy and we help publishers work with modern technologies, including AI, um, to develop a range of, kind of data-driven products and services. And my role at 67 Bricks has put me in a rather privileged position and a unique position, I think, of having worked with a number of publishers as they start to make their first kind of tentative steps into working with AI and machine learning. And although each publisher and their body of content and their business goals are unique, um, there are many shared areas of opportunity, shared challenges that come up again and again and again. Um, so I wanted to kick off my section of today by sharing five key areas that publishers are already beginning to use AI in to make a difference. Um, so the first is peer review. Um, some publishers are already using AI in the field of peer review um, to augment the current process, um, performing tasks like checking completeness of submissions, um, 
looking for undoing bias, assessing suitability for the journal in question that the author is submitted to, um, finding suitable peer reviewers in the first place, finding out if they've got conflict of interest and actually handling that whole workflow between authors and editors and reviewers. So peer review is a big one that you'll hear about in this space. Um, the second is fighting fraudulent practices. So by using natural language processing, AI can actually more um, efficiently and accurately detect plagiarism than traditional software that's just detecting whether a phrase has been copied word for word for word. Um, and it's also being used um, to detect whether data or images have been fraudulently manipulated or duplicated or altered um, on their way to publication. And there's a really nice example you can find online from Elsevier and the Harvard Medical School who are using AI to detect whether images have been fraudulently tampered with, essentially, on their way to publication. So next up, we have predicting high-impact research on emerging subject areas. So imagine publishers being able to alert your PR and marketing team um, of a potentially impactful piece of research the moment it hits your submission system. AI can actually oftentimes outperform humans in predicting the types of content that are likely to create a buzz um, once they're released to the world. Um, similarly, it can also be used to predict um, emerging subject areas, growth subject areas. Um, so potentially to inform your editorial strategy, uh, your research program, or if you're a funder, perhaps your funding strategies. I don't think that's mine. <laughs> so the fourth we've got here is also creation of content. Um, we're working with publishers, and many publishers are working on using AI um, to also generate things like abstracts, keywords, metadata, tagging. Um, for example, for legacy articles or for legacy book chapters that might not have had that kind of information associated with it when it was first put together. Um, what else? Um, another use case is to summarize research papers and generate, for example, automatically short press releases, tweets, that kind of thing. Um, and there are people out here, out there who want to take it one step further and input research data on one side and output a human readable article on the other side. Um, and you might have seen recently actually the news about OpenAI who have um, managed to produce some very convincingly written, uh, written by AI articles, articles with different tones of voice, different levels of formality, um, quite impressive and actually yeah, quite, quite terrifying. Um, number five, and this is my, my last one, is uh, delivering personalized user experiences. Um, so there's a lot out there in the world of AI. Um, being used to drive discoverability, usage, offer personalized um, features and products to researchers and authors. Um, so for example, by understanding the connections between different pieces of content, AI can drive things like personalized recommendation services. Um, it can allow publishers to produce a custom content collection. Uh, so for example, based on breaking news like Zika or Brexit or the Nobel Prize winning announcement, that kind of thing. Um, and there are also some really nice examples of products that have been um, created for researchers. Um, so researchers might be able to want to be able to ask a question of data and content rather than just inputting a, a search term, a traditional string of search terms. Um, they might want to see all the research that disputes the article they're currently reading or all the research that agrees with it. Uh, so that's a really nice use case. Um, and also, there's a company called iris.ai who have a service where you can paste in a hypothesis and be presented with a reading list. So I think that's a really nice example too. Um, so in putting my five together, I kind of collated a whole bunch of opportunities uh, for researchers, which I'm just going to leave on the screen for a moment. Uh, so there's lots out there. Um, and some examples for the publishers in the room as well. Um, so I hope it comes across that there's already a lot that's starting to happen in this space um, already today and I think there's a lot of potential for the future. I'm personally really excited about it. I'm, I'm sort of, when I did the survey myself I came out as a realist um, because I do think there are things to, to take into account, ethical concerns, difficulty of kind of reproducing human bias. Um, the biggest one we come up again and again against is just the sheer difficulty of wrangling all the data that you need in the first place. Um, so I'm really looking forward to our discussion. I think there's, there's lots uh, to talk about. So I think with that in mind, I'm going to hand over to Isabel. Thanks. Oh, sorry. 
you can see that there. Which is actually very obvious. Um, so my presentation is on, okay, so if AI is the answer, then what is the question? And I want us all to step back for a moment. This is one of my favorite headlines from the last few years, which is that if AI can fix peer review in science, AI can do anything. Obviously, it's a massive if, and it's quite a crap article. <laughs> um, uh, and we're not there yet. But when we hear questions like, what does the future of peer review look like? Uh, what, uh, how can publishers cut costs? What new business models can learned societies come up with? The answer is usually that AI is going to have something to do with it. But what? So we may not be at the point where AI can fix peer review, but as we all know, we are at the point where the various techniques can have a real impact on the processes and the insights that our organizations and research more broadly can have. Which leads me to observe that most problems that our organizations are facing are strategic, not technical. So if we're talking about uh, having the right use cases or competing investment priorities or that your data is a mess or that you don't have the right talent, these are all strategic problems, not technical ones. Um, and uh, what I think is important about that is, as always with strategy, it's about asking the right questions because most issues stem from incorrect problem definition. And so this is where I want us to step back for a moment because problem definition is obviously something that is not just a scholarly comms problem. This is a global problem that we're facing right now. And it's one that AI is throwing into sharp relief as being something that us humans are really, really bad at. Uh, and this is going to lead into some interesting discussions on ethics, I think, shortly. Let's take a famous example, which is AI's hiring algorithm. You've probably come across this. It makes an enormous difference if you ask, how do we hire the most highly qualified people? If you ask, how do we hire the best employees? How do we hire the best employees for Amazon? How do we improve the gender balance in our workforce? And a host of others that I could go on with. I think we all know what happened. Oh my God. <laughs> but going back to the questions, these demonstrate, I think, really clearly that however you frame a problem drastically depend, uh, affects the outcomes that you will get. Uh, and this works here on a micro level for, um, and really critically at a micro level for algorithms in artificial intelligence, but it also works much more broadly on a macro level for organizations and I think our industry as a whole. So that leads us to ask, uh, how do we frame problems better? This is obviously a really big topic and uh, I have a very short amount of time. But what I am going to do is to go on a whistle-stop tour of three things that I think that we all need to do right now in order to make better AI-based decisions. So this is where the whistle-stop thing starts and this is where I start speaking really quickly. So first up, you've got to understand AI. You can't do anything if you don't understand it. So I'm talking definitions, how it works, use cases and dependencies. And that's not just the people in this room who I think are actually probably more informed than most. This isn't just the CEOs or directors. This is our entire organizations because the processes and ways of thinking that AI impacts are organization wide. So we need everyone to start understanding this. Uh, after this, I'm going to tweet out some resources that I've kind of curated in terms of like a really basic understanding that would take you three hours to go through some videos and stuff. And uh, these could be shared more widely. Um, secondly, have a problem first mindset. This is obviously critical uh, in general, but it's particularly critical, I think, for artificial intelligence because with AI, you get the absolute best results by thinking about goals and not about processes. Often the process is completely different. So you really need to think about the problem that you want to solve and then the solution. Sounds obvious, you'll be surprised. In fact, I'm sure you can all think of times when that just doesn't happen. Um, and this is why also understanding AI first is critical because AI affects the way that you see problems, the way that you see solutions, and the opportunities that you spot. And as a side note, if you're thinking very quickly, 
uh, how do you pick a problem in the sea of endless, endless, endless problems? Well, at the simplest level, what AI lets you do is classify and predict faster and at higher volumes than, you can, than humans can do on their own without AI, which means that you can ask what processes can be faster or removed entirely, and what couldn't you do before because you didn't have enough people. What we're going to see first is um, uh, the quick wins are going to be around uh, productivity increases um, and automating things, a lot of uh, productivity gains. But I'm much more interested in the kind of second question, which is what can we do now for science, for research that we couldn't do before? Because this is not only where we're going to have the biggest impact, but it's also going to be where the new value propositions will come from and those new business models that everyone is looking for. And then thirdly, what would it take to implement? I mean, you've got to ask, first of all, is what you want to do actually technically feasible? Because we know how much hype there is out there, and a lot of it isn't actually technically feasible yet. Secondly, is it technically feasible for you? Which is a completely different question, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> you, sh you should definitely be considering partnerships, because a lot of the technology uh, is becoming increasingly commoditized. And that's not, but you're still going to have to consider your data and start thinking of it as a strategic asset, as an asset on the balance sheet, because this is where we're going to see uh, IP uh, increase, the value in IP increasingly being generated. So you've got to treat your data as an asset. And then lastly ask, what will you need to do to make this happen? Uh, what would you need to do to make this happen? Where is the change going to have to occur? It's going to be in data, it's going to be in processes, organizational structure, and perhaps most importantly, culture and people. So I'm looking forward to expanding on all of this more in the questions. Um, you know, with all the appropriate caveats, I'm incredibly excited about all the opportunities out there. Uh, and I think that as a strategist, for sure, the biggest question I have difficulties in answering is, what first? So thank you very much. And uh, oh, I haven't got my, you can't contact me, no details. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks to all of you for your presentations, which were great. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have a panel discussion with Q&A now. Again, if you uh, go to www.menti.com and put in the code 862791, your questions will appear on the, ski on the screen. Um, I'm going to kick off with one to begin with, actually. And um, I'm going to ask Phil, you talked about some of the actual risks of, of AI. Uh, could you expand on that for us? Right, yeah. It's, I mean, it's really... It's, it's good that we've had a panel about AI and nobody yet has mentioned the computers rising up to take over the world. Um, I don't know if anybody's currently typing it out on their mobile phone right now. <coughs> but as you can imagine, um, none of us, I don't think, think that there's a real risk of computers deciding that humanity needs to be enslaved or conquered or, or wiped out. Um, something like Terminator or, or my favourite version of this is uh, Colossus the Forbin Project, which is uh, my, my favourite uh, my favorite dramatization of computers taking over the world. But I don't think that's going to happen. Um, the big risk, I think, from, from, that comes closest to that is the idea of an AI or, a, or an algorithm having a different goal to the one that the programmer or the, or the, um, or the user of that AI um, wants it to have. So that comes down to what Isabel was talking about around correctly framing the question. You know, for example, you might imagine you've got a, an automated car and you ask it to get you to the airport before your flight leaves. It does so, but then you've got an arrest warrant out for speeding and, you know, and there's, you know, you've run over three pedestrians or something. It's the, quest, the problem that you have is not necessarily the malevolence on behalf of the AI, but more, but more a competence on behalf of the AI of it achieving something in a way that you didn't want it to achieve. So it's about alignment of goals and that's a, that's a challenge. I think another more kind of realistic challenge still is the idea of both deliberate and accidental misuse of machine learning. We're all quite familiar with, um, with, the, uh, with potential um, interference with the democratic process in recent years and the, you know, the risks associated with manipulation of social opinion, 
and all th those sorts of things. But there's also the risk of, of biases and manipulation happening not out of ill will, but out of um, incompetence is too strong a word, but certainly accidental misuse of AI. To me, that is a little bit um, analogous to the way that statistics is sometimes misused in some of our disciplines that we, you know, that we publish in or that are our institutions. Um, because what you have there is because you've added a level of abstraction to the way that the research or the, or the development or whatever it is that you're doing is being done, it becomes harder to understand what's actually going on under the hood. And the harder it, the harder it is to understand what's going on under the hood, the more likely it is that, the, that what you're doing is gonna have uh, some kind of biased output that you don't realize you're even doing. So I think those, to me, are the big two that kind of stand out, is, is diverse goals and essentially the accidental um, misuse of AI. Great, and then that, that actually ties into one of the questions we've got up there. We're currently seeing abuse of AI by Facebook, Google, um, and others. Uh, information flooding is the new censorship. Um, incentives to abuse of AI are too prevalent. How does the business model factor into controlling the behavior of organizations utilizing AI? Um, Isabel, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I have so many thoughts on that. That was, that was uh, anyone who knows me will probably know that was the question that I was particularly drawn to. Um, for me, this really comes down to incentives, um, as most things do in the end. Um, at the moment, the business models, uh, the macroeconomic incentives, the legislation, um, are pretty much all misaligned with a lot of uh, social goals that we want to achieve. So I'm interested personally in how we will see um, whether, whether we can get to a point where we can uh, see the top line being positively affected by being, uh, um, having a good ethical stance and working in a way that people um, are happy with um, when company valuation or um, revenue streams can be maximized through social good or through appropriate ethical practices, this is probably where we're going to see um, uh, improved business models. But, uh, well, actually, I won't, I won't, I could carry on. That's just my, that was the thing that uh, struck me by it, something I'm quite interested in, but I'll let someone else uh, add some thoughts. Any of, you, uh, any of you others have any views on that? Daniel? Daniel? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <It's interesting>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> As always in business, there is this, this give and take aspect, right? What, what's in it for me? So uh, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm horrified by the things that Facebook and Apple and, or Google do, but in the end, they're all doing this on the basis that somebody disclosed data or information on their free will. So uh, it's a it's a profound ethical question whether Facebook should just send all these people away they're doing business with. Uh, and we haven't found an answer to that, I think, as a, as a society. Okay. It's, it's also worth saying that the business models for these companies are, obviously they have so many businesses within them that they're incredibly multifaceted. So the, the monetizing personal data is one part of it, that where we're seeing a lot of ethical abuses. But there's also the fact that these business models have factored into them funding a huge amount of amazing cutting edge research. <laughs> um, and we've kind of managed as an industry to make ourselves irrelevant to something that we're um, basically is our core competency. Um, <laughs> they're, they're conducting uh, a lot of this kind of content intelligence work uh, within the confines of um, these private companies when they could have been doing it. Uh, these researchers could have been doing it within the academy or in any of our institutions. So these companies, you know, they have, uh, it's not simple black and white ethical questions either. Uh, and you've got the, like you said, you've got the give and you've got the take. So I think if we want to think about what kind of business models we could be doing or how we can shift them in a positive way, uh, we, can, we can learn from what these companies are doing and maybe do it better and turn it to our advantage. Great. That's what I'd like to see happen anyway. Ha ha, one can dream. <laughs> And again, from um, the questions that are coming in, is there a real implementation success story out there? Jennifer, 
Have you come across any? Story. I mean, I think that um, with all machine learning and AI projects, you have to frame the task correctly. Um, so we, if we're thinking about peer review, for example, the same AI that checks um, completeness is not going to be the same AI that um, assesses scientific novelty. It's not going to be the same AI that finds you a peer reviewer. Um, and I think people sometimes look to the industry and they, they're looking for a, an example of a great peer review AI, for example, that's replaced a, a whole person's job role, and that's, that's just not the case. Um, but there are lots of um, really good examples, I think, of um, AI being used um, to automate or augment um, small tasks in the publishing workflow. Um, I think the, I mean, TNFs, contextualized copy editing, is one that got quite a lot of um, press fairly recently. That's quite a nice one. Um, lots of good examples around categorization of content um, to which, which actually strategically can feed a lot of different features and, and things like that, um, discovery features, but also um, features around peer review. Is it suitable for this journal? Is it suitable for this slightly different journal? Um, so I think, there are, yeah, there are lots of good success stories. In, in the research um, world, things like Iris, Barrow, they're all using AI. Um, and what first steps would you um, suggest that publishers take? Um, I think, well, first up, make sure you understand what AI is and what it isn't. It's not a silver bullet, you know. Um, start with a business problem. Don't go looking for a, a solution that uses AI. Don't get distracted by the idea of doing a sexy AI, AI project. Um, but I, I think, as, as Bill mentioned earlier, be very honest about your own technical capabilities. Um, you know, you, you might want to partner, um, but also be aware that a lot of the companies that are making a lot of noise in this space are product companies who want to sell you their product, which may or may not be the right solution for you and your content and your business goals. Yeah, I mean, Daniel, you took a big step. So um, how, how was that decision made? How did you get to the point where you made the acquisition? Mm -hmm. So I've, I've only been with Cargo for one and a half years, right? So, but I saw very quickly that uh, just optimizing the traditional scholarly publishing process would not be enough, enough for us. And uh, the first step was to, to root this openness for new technologies, including AI, in the DNA and in the strategy of the company. And then this was a big step, you know. Cargo was established 1890, so we've, uh, we've come a long way just uh, with scholarly publishing. So <clears throat> I think that's, that's the first thing, to, to recognize that uh, you have to enter new, new territories to, uh, to be successful also in the future. And um, I showed this on my slide, right? This, this was part Carger strategy with the two cycles and it was part all, all these uh, parts of the cycle where AI can actually uh, be beneficial or be, be made to be beneficial. And uh, we saw one, one common denominator in all these use cases, and that's uh, how to understand content and how to understand queries into that content. So this, this was maybe the, the, the second uh, enlightenment for us, which then drove us to, to look out for strategic partners and or acquisitions in exactly that space. Right? And we will keep it to uh, what Cargo is specialized in, health sciences. So I mentioned that uh, some, of the, some of the AI magic in, in Quirtle is machine learning and other approaches, but some of it is also this curated ontology that we think uh, makes a difference in the discovery of, uh, of uh, facts and of opportunities and trends. Great. And um, Phil, you, actually, you talked about some of the actual risks. Would you like to expand on some of those? This is not the question you asked me at the beginning. Sorry? You asked me that sorry, the um, sorry, sorry, <laughs> um, um, sorry. You, you talked about um, um, uh, machine learning affecting academia. Yeah, yeah, I think that machine learning is going to affect, and already is, right? The many universities have informatics departments, and they're already doing things like that kind of assertion mapping that I talked about, where you essentially. T it, to me, it's analogous to kind of wringing the literature out to get the information out that nobody can find because everybody's too busy to read everything and kind of make all those connections. I think in, in, in principle, in theory, it should be possible to, for a computer to read lots and lots of information, lots and lots of articles, to map between those different assertions, to look at that text and effectively 
deduce things that, that ought to be true, based on what we already know, and deduce things that, that could well be true, and then, um, sorry, the other way around, deduce things that ought to be true and induce things that could well be true, and then perhaps even have a, a machine, a robot in an automated lab, um, run those tests and do those, and do those experiments, and then feed back to the AI, and you can basically build information and build knowledge um, that way. I think there are two important caveats to that. I think that you're still there extracting information that's already latent in the content, not inventing new information, um, which I think is important. So you don't remove human creativity from that process. Uh, there's a risk there of, of not having enough scientists know enough about how to do science anymore. You know, if, it's all, if it all gets handed over to the AI, you could end up with a certain level of stagnation and, and lack of creative thought, at least the way that artificial intelligence works today. And the other risk is very similar to the sorts of risk that um, Sophia Noble talks about in her book, Algorithms of Oppression, which is about the fact that the, that the, the AI is only as good as the data that feeds mm -hmm. into it. And it's really important that the people who are using that AI are able to understand the limitations of both the data and the way in which the data is processed and analyzed, otherwise they could very easily misuse it and end up with the wrong results. Um, there's, there's a growing concern amongst researchers that machine learning could potentially exacerbate the reproducibility crisis because of that extra layer of abstraction that it's creating, because people who don't necessarily know how the machine is doing its work will do its work, give an answer that isn't accurate, and then they publish it and everybody says, well, the computer says so, therefore it must be right. Mm. I'd like to um, jump in on something there because we're talking about um, you've got the sun right in your eyes, haven't you? Uh, it's yeah. just my blinding brilliance. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, got one awful thing to say. It's just a joke. Um, so um, yeah, you mentioned Sophia Noble there, and actually, yeah, I see there as well. Like, don't believe the hype. Like, no, no. Like, yeah, you've got to be 100 percent critical of uh, every single claim that you uh, get given. I was working with a company recently, or um, I met them. They seemed like an incredibly interesting startup you go through talking to them and then you're like ah, no you are lying about most of this you know uh, so you have to constantly check but you've got to be curious but talking about um, uh, whether we'll see problems exacerbated I really want to share like what one of my biggest uh, concerns is which is about um, you know we probably want to get onto the topic of ethics and there's, there was one paper, which is, I guess, <laughs> one that just really, really spoke to me, um, which is by, I think it's um, Liu and Dean and a whole load of people at Berkeley. And it's a paper called um, Delayed Impact of Fair Machine Learning Criteria. Like that. Um, and what they did uh, was they were looking at the impact of fairness criteria um, uh, on populations. So, for example, you might use fairness criteria in machine learning models to determine um, whether underprivileged populations uh, or demographics should be allowed to, for example, go to university um, or given a loan or whatever. Um, and these are the sorts of things that are already happening a lot. But what they did was track the outcomes over time. And they found that some people who were given a uh, loan to go to university, oh, this should be great, this should transform their life. What they found was down the line, it actually had quite, quite significant negative impact on them because they weren't able to repay the loan um, and their lives from some like, you know, slightly odd criteria were deemed to be worse. And so you're like, ah, oh, our fairness criteria have had adverse outcomes here. We were trying to improve these people's lives and th it hasn't worked. And so what, but what, that's all fine, that's really interesting um, and a very important thing to, to look at. But what concerned me was in the paper, they, their conclusion from this was that they should go and rethink the model, that they should shift the model, they should shift the decision trees um, to use like ma uh, outcome maximization explicitly, or they should switch to uh, um, algorithms that focused on um, uh, algorithms that focus on outcomes rather than kind of the inputs, which to me is unbearably concerning because they're saying that ah oh, no no. Um, 
using these types of approaches, these ethical approaches are fine, um, we're just going to shift our model and then it will all be okay. But I don't think we're at the stage where the algorithms are good enough to be making these huge judgment calls on people's lives. I don't think we have the data, um, uh, enough of the data to be able to, um, that's accurate enough to make those kind of calls as well. And then, most concerning of all, in the entire paper, there was not sing one single mention of the word ethics or ethical. There was one comment around the use of sensitive data, and that was it. And this is the type of thing that we, potentially as a scholarly communications industry, have to start thinking more, uh, more about how can, we, how can we support the doing of research in an ethical manner. Um, how can we champion these types of important things? How can we work with authors to think about those types of things if they're not thinking about them themselves? So there's a role for us to play and we have to shift, more, you know, shift our thinking more broadly. But yeah, the, uh, uh, with a whole load of wonderful benefits come a whole load of rather terrifying side effects and you've got to be hypercritical at, at every level. It's something I just found very interesting. And so, so what would be the most exciting AI development of the last year for you? What would be the AI candy that you would choose first if you were um, either a publisher or a librarian? Oh, there have been so many exciting developments over the last year. That paper was, was written last year. Um, I think for me, in my sweet shop of dreams, um, I think probably, so 2018, I think people were kind of talking about as the year of NLP. So if 2016 was about um, computer vision, 2018 was about NLP and huge advances in um, lots of different areas of natural language processing and language more broadly. So again, there was a paper by uh, Howard and Ruder, um, 2018 paper on universal language modeling, um, a, a fine tuning for text classification. But what I, <laughs> uh, I'll, pass, I'll pass that. What I found most exciting here was, and this is just one example of a lot of the techniques in the field, field which is using transfer learning, um, is, say you've got, uh, it's, it's very easy to translate English to French. English to French and French to English is basically a solved problem. And that's predominantly because we've got um, endless amounts of um, language pairs, sentence pairs, because, for example, all EU, EU documents are written in French and English. So the models for French to English are really, really easy. Um, less so for English to Chinese, but there are still loads of language pairs, enough for good, good models. But there are very few for English to Romanian, or say Romanian to Thai. Like, you know, you, this is, this is, this is, there's not a lot of language pairs, like, <laughs> there's not a big text corpus for that. And what they've done is used transfer learning on um, large data sets to be able to fine tune them for small data sets. Let me give you an example. Um, so say you want to translate your Thai sentence into Romanian. What they now do um, a lot of the time is translate Thai into what is essentially a kind of meta uh, romance language. So you translate into this romance language that doesn't really exist uh, in the latent space. <laughs> uh, and then you, from there you fine tune it into Romanian, into Spanish, into whatever you want to. Uh, and I find this incredibly exciting, first of all, because I had a um, linguistic background back in the day, but also because I think it really clearly demonstrates one of the things that I mentioned about um, artificial intelligence being about goals, not processes. If you have humans translating sentences, you've got someone who's got a specialism in Romanian, a specialism in Thai, and then you do direct translation. If you tried to mimic that, which is what they did in the past when they were learning, um, when they were originally teaching these language models, they got quite a long way, but not very far. Where the big breakthrough has happened is by doing something that humans would never do. You're doing a completely different process to get to um, the result that you want. So you think about the goal and not about the process, and a whole load of really exciting possibilities uh, turn up. And I guess this is a question to each of you. Um, what concerns you most about um, AI and machine learning, in a few words? I feel I've just spoken, so that's something. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, you want to do that? Yeah, sure. uh, so, yeah, for me, it's, um, well, it's, it's the big ethical concern. It's um, recreating biases that exist in the training data that we feed. So, I mean, to, to put this back to kind of publishing and research, um, we've seen this in the peer review world. What training data are you going to use? You're probably going to use your entire publication history for your journal going back to when the journal was founded. Have those decisions always been fair? Um, what's the gender split? What's the you know, country by country split? East versus West split, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, we see this um, recreated 
um, if you feed this into an algorithm, you'll, you'll see that um, female authors are discriminated against, for example. Um, so to my mind, that's the biggest concern. Cool. Well, I've talked a little bit about that danger of abstraction. Um, so I won't, I, won't, I won't repeat that, that particular risk. I think that kind of drawing on some of the ideas that we've drawn out of the panel, um, I think that it's true to say that we're in the early days of what machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to eventually be able to do. And as a result of that, we don't yet have a firm ethical framework with how to treat it. And that's a societal problem that we need to kind of come to grips with. And while we still don't have an ethical framework, we're going to continue to have these challenges where we don't really understand where the line lies. So, so look at politics. Does it have to go up a level? <laughs> I mean, one of the questions yeah. that's come in, should social media giants such as Facebook and Twitter be redefined legally as a publisher? I don't know whether that's the solution. Um, one thing I think we should always, always do is, you know, is, is fully understand the problem before we jump to a solution. Um, and I can see why people would go for that but I don't know whether that's the right answer or not. Um, I think we have to figure out where that line lies first and foremost before we try to propose solutions to it. So, you know, just to, just to kind of take it as a look at that politics example, we, we find it okay for politicians and their staff to go door to door and give people leaflets and give them information and give their side of the story, and that's fine, right? That's campaigning. But what if we're amplifying that voice through social media all of a sudden, we've decided as a society that that's not okay. It's not okay for Facebook to be pushing that message and selectively choosing pieces of information so that the reader sees that. And that is quite possibly because the reader does not know they're being fed that information selectively. Um, it might be because that information is being generated not by the politicians themselves or by the campaign organization, but is being kind of cultured, if you like, and so it's deceptive. Is that the problem? Is that why we don't find that objectionable? We need to understand what it is about these practices that we don't like, and then we can look, and then we can think about how we legislate around them and solve the problems. Thanks, Daniel. <clears throat> My main concern is that the concerns will somehow blur the view on the potential of uh, artificial intelligence, and I think more work has to be done to to show what the strengths of humans are with respect to the processes that we try to map with the thing that we call artificial intelligence. Right? Uh, psychologists know two concepts of intelligence. One is uh, fluid intelligence and, and, and one is crystalline intelligence. And crystalline is about how well you do in situations based on previous knowledge. That's where machines can cope or can keep up quite nicely, but the other one is, uh, is liquid uh, or fluid intelligence. So, uh, for example, I have uh, no experience with animals at all, except for having uh, killed two guinea pigs, uh, pigs in my time. So, uh, uh, fluid intelligence, <laughs> fluid uh, uh, by neglect, not by my own hands, I should maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's equally bad, I know. Uh, but uh, the point I wanted to make, so uh, fluid intelligence would be about how well would I do if you asked me to breed rabbits tomorrow, right? something I have no previous knowledge in. And I think uh, in that space, uh, humans will be around for some time, and uh, we should uh, explain this to people much more. I'd like to pick up on a couple of things there. First of all, I think it would be absolutely hilarious if at a point where all publishers def uh, desperately wish they were tech companies, that tech companies got redefined as publishers. That would be really funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, al but also, um, on a much more serious note, um, I heard Max Gabriel from um, TNF uh, say something which I just, I really like this metaphor, um, so I'll share it with you. Um, he said that, um, we could think of uh, AI as a bit, bit like medicine. Um, so when you get a, you know, a drug or pill because you've got a headache or some kind of illness, you are you happy to take the drug because you're like, yes, I will get these benefits from them, and you're aware of the benefits. But with that drug, you get a pamphlet of all the side effects, and you're aware of the side effects. And what's happened over the last few years is that we've all got, um, or especially like some of the tech companies, really excited about all the benefits and people have been chasing after them. And now we're getting more and more obvious, you know, even over the last year, some really terrible side effects coming out that haven't been 
um, that haven't that, what, that are only now kind of becoming clear, and increasingly they're becoming more clear. And what we need to do is have a more um, holistic view of like, yes, you get benefits, but you get side effects, and how can you reach the kind of optimal maximization um, of of positive impact? I really like that metaphor. Yeah, and, and we have to be careful not to. <clears throat> can I just add something? We we have to be careful not to overshoot in the direction of the, yeah. of these uh, side effects because <clears throat> we all know that uh, if you read through the pamphlet mm. of a drug attentively, you will not take the drug anymore yeah, because yeah, exactly. you think you're going to die, and still <laughs> exactly. you're you're taking it. So we have to find a similar way with it. Yeah. Kind of thing. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And right. something that um, concern. If we're going back to concerns, although maybe no, you're going to ask another question. Uh, Carry on. We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, were you going to round up or ask another question? Um, yeah, I was going to say um, we, we've got. We're going to do one more poll and ask the big question again. Who's got the clicker at the moment? Who's stolen the clicker? Who's stolen the clicker? Surely, surely. Ah, got it. Thank you. Um, the next, one? please. Ne last one. Is AI good for society? We're going to ask this question again. Have you been convinced that it's a good thing, or have you have you been left, left unmoved? How does that compare? More optimism. Yeah, more optimism. Great. Well, look, a big thank you to all the panelists and thank you to you, the audience. Um, I think they deserve a big round of applause. Great. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, panel. See, I told you it was going to be good, and it was. Um, I must apologize for some of the technical problems. That's entirely down to, uh, to uh, us uh, running the event. Um, we're having problems. If you're giving a, a slideshow, if you've experienced it, you're giving a slideshow, and you're expecting to be able to see your own slides, and you can't, it's very disorienting. And we've got some cabling problems that will be sorted out during the break. Um, but uh, we will get there. Um, also, sorry to Phil, particularly, for being blinded by the... Uh, <laughs> bright sunlight. We normally have snow at about this time, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, great, that was really good. Um, I'm going to send you to the break now. I've just got a couple of things to say. Um, firstly, uh, once again, sponsor material on the tables. Do have a look through that. That would be interesting. Um, second thing is the temperature is now 22.2 degrees up here. Uh, who's too hot? One person. Who's too cold? Four people. Okay, so we seem to be in the zone. Okay, all right. I, I thought I'd check in with you on that. Right, last thing before we go to break, ladies and gentlemen. Last, last thing before we go. Last thing before we go to. Now, oh, come on. Getting unruly now. There's cake and tea in a minute. If you behave yourselves. Okay, last thing before we go to break, what I would say is uh, during the break we tend to clear the tables, refresh the drinks and so on. Um, you should feel free to move around and sit somewhere new and make new friends kind of as you go around and the, the slackers at the back could move forward and take the seats of the swats at the front and that sort of thing. So do feel free to mill around and make new friends because I think it's a fun part of the conference. So um, could you join me in thanking the panel one more time and then off to break. Thank you. Thank you.